Nazis don't care if they give pleasure to someone. It's, they, it's, they are auto-erotic. They are focused on themselves as the source of erotic pleasure. They masturbate with other people's bodies. End of story. Inevitably, the sexuality of patients with personality disorders is thwarted and stunted. The somatic narcissist flaunts his sexual conquests, parades his possessions, exhibits his muscles. The cerebral narcissist is often celibate. Even when he has a girlfriend or a spouse, he usually abstains from sex. Usually, the bullying side, the side who withholds sex, would accuse the other party of um, being nagging. And narcissists are very, very particular. A typical fetishist, for example, he likes feet, let's say feet fetishes, foot fetishes. He would be not so choosy. A foot is a foot. Yeah, he likes this kind of food, that kind of food, but generally he likes feet, not the narcissist. The cerebral narcissist is indistinguishable from the schizoid. He is asexual and prefers activities and interactions which emphasize his intelligence or intellectual achievements. Many cerebral narcissists are celibate even when they get married. Uh, the cerebral's asexuality is total, not only with the, with the intimate partner or life partner or secondary source, source of secondary supply. So when the cerebral is asexual, he does not respond to any sexual cues, sexual advances, courting, by any uh, possible sex partner. So for example, let's take an extreme situation, he would enter his hotel room and there would be a beautiful naked woman waiting for him in bed. He would not respond. He would not react. And this of course gives you the answer to porn, because he would react to pornography. If he saw the same woman that was in his bed, naked, in a movie, in a pornographic movie, he would react to her. He would have an erection, he would masturbate, and he would ejaculate, watching her, but on a movie, not as a... And this again comes to the issue of libido and thanatos. One of the reasons the cerebral narcissist finds it pretty easy uh, to not have sex with other people and for very, very, very long periods of time. One of the reasons this is easy is because the narcissist of both types, somatic and cerebral, is auto-erotic. In other words, he finds himself as the most exciting, arousing sexual object. The somatic narcissists and the psychopath use their partner's bodies to masturbate with, and their sexual conquests serve merely to prop up their wavering self-confidence in the case of the somatic narcissist or to satisfy a physiological need in the case of the psychopath. Somatic narcissist and psychopath have no sexual playmates, only sexual play things. Having conquered the target, they discard it, withdraw and move on heartlessly. Sex with the somatic narcissist, pyrotechnics and acrobatic society is likely to be an impersonal an emotionally alienating and draining experience. The partner is often treated as an object, an extension of the somatic narcissist, a kind of toy, a warm and pulsating vibrator. The autoeroticism is the key to the narcissist's sexuality and therefore makes it very easy for him to retreat. He is, narcissist is self-sufficient in everything. Narcissist doesn't need any other people. He doesn't need emotions, he doesn't need sex, he doesn't need, he is totally self-sufficient. And, and so if, if he cannot get sex from, out, or doesn't want to get sex from outside, it's okay. He can supply his own sex. 
if he, he doesn't need emotions. He do, so he's, the narcissist is really an autonomous, totally autonomous unit. Prostubation has always been universal. It's always been universal. But when the narcissist masturbates, he's not the same like a healthy person. When the narcissist masturbates, he is making love to himself. It's an auto-erotic act, not a stimulatory physiological act. M majority of healthy people masturbate, men and women. Women a bit less, but men and women masturbate. And when they masturbate, they do it essentially for physiological reason. The fantasies that go with masturbation, ironically, are extremely primitive and basic. The fantasies that are not connected to masturbation, daydreaming, are much more complex and they, they, they are more like erotic novel, more like Fifty Shades of Grey. So when women have fantasies, for example, that are not connected to sex, they would have a very elaborate story about meeting up, you know, the gorgeous stud and how he rapes them and, and they will have a whole, a whole movie. But when they masturbate, they usually would have a one element or two, and same with men. So mastur masturbation is essentially mechanical, physiological stimulation of the genitals to obtain release. It's about physiological release, not with the narcissist. Narcissist, as usual, is opposite to healthy people. When he masturbates, he has very complex, elaborate, ornate fantasies which resemble books or movies when he masturbates. Daydreaming of the narcissist is extremely basic. I'm going to find a woman, I'm going to rape her. It's extremely basic. And a lot of narcissist sexuality, unfortunately, that I must say, that is society's fault, not the narcissist's fault, a lot of this sexuality is stigmatized. It's considered perverted, deviant, uh, taboo. So the narcissist retreats, retreats. His fantasies would be would be widely considered sick, perverted, deviant, and so he's ashamed. He's ashamed to share. There is no such thing as perverse sexuality. <laughs> that makes the topic a bit difficult to discuss. Victorian middle class values aside, if the sexual behavior harms no one, including oneself, and is consensual between consenting adults, then the sexual behavior is considered by psychologists and psychiatrists to be utterly both healthy and normal. I repeat, there is no such thing as sexual perversion. Well, narcissist, narcissist sadism and masochism, appearing from the outside, are actually instrumental and functional. One of them is to control people, motivate them, control them, and so on. It's nothing to do with classic sadism. There's no joy from the pain. The pain doesn't give pleasure. It's just a way of asserting control, establishing social order, obtaining results. And in sexual settings, the sadism is, a, is part of the power play that the narcissist plays in every field of his life. You know? and, and it's therefore not sadism. And sadism must have a component of emotion. The sadist loves to hurt people. He loves to cause, to cause pain. It gives him pleasure to cause pain. That's not the case with Narcissus. Narcissus doesn't derive pleasure from causing pain. He derives pleasure with what he can make people do using pain. When the Narcissus will, will seek masochism in sex or in discipline or when the Nazis will seek pain or hurt, wherever it is, is nothing to do with masochism. It has to do, again, with, fulfilling, with obtaining goals or fulfilling functions. So discipline will remind him of love and intimacy. Uh, if he's masochistic in, in a relationship with a, with a woman, it will fulfill other functions. Maybe the woman wants it, maybe other. It's always goal-oriented or functional or instrumental or it's never pleasure for the sake of pleasure. There's no such thing with the Nazis, by the way, in anything, not only sex. Spanking, and not only spanking, discipline in general, whipping, spanking, many other, and all these manifestations, they, they introduce certainty to the abuse. They make the abuse unequivocal, clear, certain, 
cannot be argued with. In other words, it reduces anxiety. By introdu discipline introduces certainty. Certainty introduces, it reduces anxiety. And that's why the narcissist feels much better after such a session. His anxiety is gone. Now, his anxiety is gone in spanking, for example, in ways which are, which are like multitasking, because not only the anxiety is gone, but he has a great feeling of intimacy. Remember that in the narcissist's mind, pain is connected to love, connected to intimacy. Actually, because he caused a lot of it in his child's mind, it's all, it's all the same thing. It's all, his inside is the outside, the outside is his inside. Pain is love, not connected, is love. Love is pain. You know, everything is everything. So, spanking, spanking has multiple purposes. First of all, it clarifies the situation. It's clear that I'm going to abuse you. It's clear you will have discipline. It's not in the air. It's not, when will mommy attack me? Now, in one hour, in two hours, tomorrow, the next day. And I will live in tension, I will live in anxiety, waiting for mommy to attack me. No, mommy will now take the paddle and attack me. It's makes the situation clear. Clear, less anxiety, good feeling. Second thing, it's intimate. There's intimacy involved. First of all, my ass is, <laughs> I'm naked. There's intimacy involved. And uh, intimacy is intimately connected with, with uh, abuse, with the pain, and intimately connected with, uh, with love. So it's a loving act of intimacy involving unequivocal, Clear pain, not speculated pain, clear pain. The clarity is crucial, crucial, because it introduces intimacy, introduces love, introduces... Following the session, the narcissist would feel wonderful because he had received a dose of intimacy, a dose of love, a dose of clear abuse, so he doesn't have to be anxious. It has happened already, so he doesn't have to anticipate and so on, so he, he, would feel, he would feel wonderful, and he would feel even doubly wonderful, because his view of the world, his Weltanschauung, his theory of the world, has been proven right. His theory of the world is, there's no love without pain, there's no intimacy without pain. And here it is. He received the spanking, and it was like an experiment in physics. He tested the theory, and it proved right. It's always gratifying when our theory of the world proves right. In proper BDSM, there is actually no dominance or submission. The parties are partners. They negotiate a role play, like theater, where one of them plays the submission, submissive, and one of them plays the dominant. The submissive has a lot of say. She can stop the, I'm saying she because most submissive are women. She can stop the, the act. She can direct the act. She can say, don't do this, do this. She can, so, in typical BDSM, because there are extreme forms of BDSM, like surrender, like, I'm, I'm not talking about this, but in typical BDSM, the BDSM, by the way, that is practiced by 15%, 1-5% of uh, adult population in America, in the United States. It's much more common than people know. So in this type of uh, BDSM, it's accepted that the bottom, the sub, has equal power to the top, and sometimes more. It's a role play, negotiated, and, and so on. In this sense, BDSM does not fit narcissists. Narcissists do not like to negotiate. They hate to be with equal power, equipotence. So narcissists would be very bad in BDSM, actually. However, many practices are subsumed under BDSM which actually have little to do with classic BDSM. And these are extreme forms of BDSM, and there the narcissist finds pleasure. This is the BDSM, for example, BDSM, which, which is um, the kind of kink that involves humiliation, that gives the narcissist pleasure because of the humiliation. It's, there is element here of dominance, converting the woman to a prostitute, uh, humiliating her, punishing her, narcissist. Narcissus is the outcome of a woman who tortured him. He wants to punish all women. He's a misogynist. He hates women. So humiliation BDSM 
will work. Violent BDSM, choking, nipple pinching, I mean, esthesia, shibari, this kind of thing would appeal to a narcissist, absolutely. Shibari, which is a part of the kanbuki, is uh, not exactly bondage. It uses ropes, like in Western bondage. But the emphasis is not on bondage. The emphasis is on aesthetic values. The human body is used as a sculpture. The ropes are very special and they have aesthetic value. Narcissists are going to misinterpret Japanese practices as forms of super extreme dominance because the body is distorted and hung and you know, and they're gonna love it because it looks like this. This is the this is the the real McCoy. This is torture. They're gonna interpret it as torture, which would horrify Japanese. Mm -hmm. And so many narcissists practice these kind of things and couple it with actual violence, like nipple pinchers and drawing blood and vampirism and so. Shibari and uh, took a very ugly. Um, decadent, deformed form in the West because it's been hijacked by violent people, aggressive people, psychopaths, narcissists, hijacked, coupled with real violence, real damage, and made into a sick, malignant art form, uh, form of the original artistic practice. Narcissists would, Narcissus therefore does not engage in bondage. As I said, bondage is consensual. Bondage is to please the partner as much as to please yourself. Usually, actually, mostly to please the partner. You're just an instrument. The dom is an instrument in this case. And narcissists do not do bondage. They do, as I said, hostage taking. And then they use the incapacitation of the victim to inflict severe pain and damage, non-consensual in many cases. All these practices in the hands of narcissists have become cancerous and are extremely dangerous. I would never dare to have BDSM session with narcissists or psychopaths. Never. Ever. Because he doesn't see it the same way. So, you would say, what about pedophilia? Do you justify it? Of course not. Pedophilia does not involve consensual sex between consenting adults. So what about coprophagia, using feces for sex play? Well, that happens to be medically very dangerous to, one's, to oneself and to others. It's also out of bounds and beyond the pale. It's also pathological. But these are, even these are not considered or called perversions. They are paraphilias. They are unusual sex practices. The truth is that absolutely anything can be a sexual object. Absolutely anything can be an object of desire. And absolutely anything can create sexual arousal and excitation. When I say anything, I mean anything. A roll of toilet paper, um, a ski, a ski uh, outfit, a latex uh, glove, the heel of a, of a woman's shoe, the woman's foot, uh, her nose, I mean, absolutely everything can and does create sexual arousal and excitation. The overwhelming vast majority of humanity are fetishes. Even when you meet a woman, you, you um, reduce her to body parts. No one pays attention to the totality of a woman when he first sees the woman. He immediately, the man immediately scans the breast, the face, the feet, whatever, turns him on, yeah? um, And so fetishism is the natural state of sexuality. Not, the, not, not an aberration, not a deviance, not a perversion, as Victorian sexuality would have us believe, and we are still living in Victorian age. Fetishism is the normal state. And the thing is that, as I said, fetishism is li virtually unlimited. So you can have people who are attracted to elements or components or ingredients that are unusual. 
it is not their attraction to a specific element that is unusual. It is the element that is unusual. The fact that they are attracted to something specific is not unusual. This is the rule. That's the common state. It's just that their choice of what to be attracted to is unusual. But if you read textbooks in sexuality and psychology, they will tell you that being attracted to a specific element is, is sick, is unusual. She's a lie, simple lie. Any sexologist will tell you it's a lie. But it's a lie we don't dare to discuss openly. It's simply a lie. So I therefore don't think that there's anything special in narcissists um, dealing with fetishes and so on. There may be something special in the specific fetishes that narcissists choose, which reflect their, uh, for example, need for objectification or need for novelty seeking, adventures, suppose a ski guy or need for or need for utter and total uh, surrender which is when you become a pet when your pets are owned domesticated controlled and slaughtered yes the fetish per se is should be all the, all the textbooks should be written exactly opposite exactly reverse narcissists are very very particular a typical fetishist for example he likes feet, let's say feet fetishes, foot fetishes. He would be not so choosy. A foot is a foot. Yeah, he likes this kind of food, that kind of food, but generally he likes feet. Not the Nazis. Nazis has, has, we have a highly specific foot. So they are very, extremely detailed in, the, in their demands. They would go hours, days, months, until they find the right, right woman body part, object. The real abnormality, the real aberration is people who don't have fetishes. That's very worrying. These people worry me a lot. Because, for example, it's possible to construe, it's possible to claim that pedophiles are people who do not have fetishes. The pedophile does relate to the totality of the child. Most pedophiles, 80% of pedophiles, are not attracted to children sexually. They are attracted to the company of children. They are attracted to the control, to controlling the child. They are attracted to the child's personality. When you talk to pedophiles, why they were attracted to a specific child, they will talk about the child in terms of, of a lover. They would say he had, he had sparkling personality. He had a captivating smile. I couldn't resist him. He was so cute. He was so wonderful. It, pedophiles actually have a holistic, total view of sexuality. That's the reason why very few of them actually end up having sex with the children. Very few pedophiles actually have sex. They don't seek the sex, they seek the child. So this is an example of pathologized sexuality, sick sexuality. I would be very worried by people who are not fetishes. That's my view. Like with everything else, there are numerous myths about pedophiles. First of all, it is not true that pedophiles are attracted only to children. A majority of pedophiles are heterosexual, and the majority of them have families and children of their own. And they are attracted to opposite sex, actually and actively attracted to opposite sex. That's a majority. Majority, 20% uh, of the population have constant pedophile fantasies. It's not rare. Majority of fathers are sexually attracted to their teenage daughters. It's also a fact. Um, I said before, anything can be a sexual object. Your daughter could be a sexual object. Why not? She's young, she's beautiful, she's, you know, she's nubile, she's sexy. There's no problem in principle for a father to be attracted, sexually attracted to his, to his daughter. I would have found it actually very disturbing if a man <laughs> with all the equipment would not be attracted to a young female just because technically he is her father. 
that would for me indicate some serious sexual disturbance. The drive to have sex with children is ancient and until extremely recently codified in the law. In Britain, until 160 years ago, in Britain, the legal age for marriage for a, for a woman was 10 years old. 10. In Yemen, until a few years ago, was 12. In Afghanistan was 12. And so on. This is culture dependent. In the vast majority of in the vast majority of the world until very recently, a woman at the age of 12 was able to conceive. And the minute she had a period, she was able to conceive and was considered you know, eligible for marriage. Now the very concept of child is very new. As the concept of child was invented, again in Victorian Britain and in France this time, the concept of child was invented, we started to have prohibitions on certain interactions with children. Now, pedophilia is and should remain a crime, active pedophilia. And so we should distinguish between the act and the fantasies. Fantasies are common, they are not unique to narcissists. They are detailed. There is a sprawling industry of child pornography online. Because of that, the, and the fantasy should not be suppressed, cannot be suppressed, cannot be fought, cannot be, on the very contrary, I think it will be counterproductive. So, what should be monitored very closely are the acts. And this is where your next, the, your other question comes in, where's the line? Where's the line? First of all, because of the unique structure of narcissists and psycho, psychopaths' personality, the risk of incest is much higher with narcissists and psychopaths. And the risk of pedophilia, active pedophilia, is, is much higher with narcissists and psychopaths. Because they regard the children as an extension of themselves, so they're actually having sex with themselves. Because they think they are actually educating the child or doing the child a favor, introducing the child to sex. Because they believe that uh, the child needs some kind of special protection. Because, I mean, they, it's endless. Very big risk with narcissists and psychopaths. So with narcissists and psychopaths, the minute inappropriate behavior begins to show up of the kind you described with the bathroom and so on, this, this must be cause for serious alert because it's a slippery slope. The Nazi starts by entering the shower when the child is naked and before you know it, he's having sex with the child. It's, in the case of Nazis and psychopaths, there's no impulse control, no boundaries, no limits, no obedience to rules, no. So there you cut it the minute there is the first hint of inappropriate uh, behavior. Not with normal people. With normal healthy people, a conversation would do. Listen, you embarrass a child, it's not okay. Child mis may misunderstand what you're doing. You know, it's, it's okay, you can talk to healthy normal people, no need for alarm. Or, but with narcissists and psychopaths you have to be, you aggressively defend the child. You have to aggressively protect the child and educate the child. There, if, if father is doing this, it's not okay. You should tell father, please, father, can you leave there? I mean, you should teach the child to be proactive to set the ch for the child to set her or his own boundaries and enforce them and warn the child to identify warning signs.